Today is Wednesday, March 6th, 2024, and you're listening to the Ask a Christian podcast. I'm your host, Nate. All right, chinchilla care tips. Who wanted to know about chinchillas? Well, if you do, apparently they're okay pets, and uh, we have some tips for you to take care of them. Great. Okay, then we get into uh, Solomon and Herod's temple dimensions and how high was the thing really and what's the difference between the two. So if you care about architectural measurements in cubits, uh, this is the place for you. Next, we we finally go in depth. We talk about it from time to time. Someone has a question about women pastors and is it biblical? So we talk about the parameters, the Bible, not us, not the patriarchy. Um, Well, that way. But, um, you, you know, the, the Bible, uh, we talk about the way the Bible sets it up and the requirements to be a pastor. Um, is that it? You just have to be a man? Does God hate women? I don't know. Let's talk about it. So we go into detail from First Timothy and, um, and Titus um, about the, the requirements in very much black and white that the Bible gives for what it takes to be an elder, a pastor, an overseer, um, and all the other things. So it, it's a pretty good discussion. And then uh, Michael, our Canadian atheist uh, friend, shows up and fights with Chris about presuppositional apologetics for a while. (laughs) So, um, the presup fight continues. All right, so uh, enjoy these topics and more. Have an awesome day. Check out the Ask a Christian store. Grab some merchandise. Keep this thing on air. And keep us sharing the gospel with people who need it. Until next time, see you later. What is this about? I thought were easy to take care of. You can't, you're not supposed to get them wet. Like they take like gremlins, baths. like gremlins exactly, like <laughs> yeah, gizmo. Like, like you can't get them wet. They live a long time. I think that's another deterrent for a lot of people is they have a really long life expectancy. Um, you don't want a pet to live long. What's well, your life expectancy? Like ten years or like twenty? Man, people well, are heartless, more like <laughs> monsters. Like no, yeah. I only I only want to commit to a pet for like six years. <laughs> um. <clears throat> Yeah, you, so you got to be real careful because, like I said, you can't really get them wet. They'll lose their fur if you get them wet. What? Yeah, so you don't really want to get a chinchilla wet. Um, they How have to take, take a bath. How do these have, things live in the wild? It they rains. Take, <laughs> they take dust baths. Um, you get like this little box for them to spin and flip around in, and you and you buy this this chinchilla dust, and you. And they love it. They go. It's so much fun to watch them take a dust bath. They go in there and they just roll and flip all over. The, like dust just goes everywhere inside the little compartment. And I hope um, the kids never get a hold of that. They're like, Dad, we're gonna take a dust bath. I'm like that doesn't count for so you. so much fun. And they have to chew enough, you know, to keep their teeth down. So you gotta have chew toys for them because they gotta keep their little teeth um, chiseled down. But. Um, uh, Wait, know, what's the teeth thing? So I have to grind. I have to like file my chinchilla's teeth. No, 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 no. You just have to provide chew toys for him to be able to chew and gnaw on. Okay, he, okay. He keeps them ground down. Yeah. What is this about cooling stones? What is this about? Mm, um, they can get hot really easily. So, um, you you just want to make sure that you keep like a cooling stone in their cage so that they can uh, curl up on that if they need to. Is this something um, like powered that's like a refrigerator kind of thing? No. Oh, no. Ours wasn't. It was literally like a little granite kind of slab. <laughs> that, Got it. But honestly, we never, because because of being in the house, like we never really had an issue with the temperature control or, you know, Sheldon ever getting overheated or anything. Like we don't, I guess if you live somewhere where like you keep your windows open and your house might heat up or whatever, you might need to be more concerned but we we've never had an issue with that um, like i have a i have a, like a tile floor in my kitchen and living room is that like sufficient like is that going to be nice and oh yeah oh yeah no that'd be fine and um but yeah no i mean like i said he's and and i think it has a lot to do with like the personalities and how much they enjoy you and stuff probably has a lot to do with how much they're handled um, you know, if you handle them a lot and you get them used to being held by people, they're probably going to be a lot more affectionate and warm. Um, they love to eat uh, fresh produce. Ours actually kind of has a little bit of a sweet tooth, which I I don't let the kids do it very often. But like, give that boy some frosting, and mm. <laughs> <laughs> he's just like, "What? This is the best thing ever!" But mostly, we just stick to um. 
you know, this is sounding roses. more and more like I have to be a very responsible pet owner as opposed to What's like having a cat. Chinchilla? Is it chinchilla? <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know, but he's he's fun. And you know, my other son's got one. Um, because they've enjoyed Sheldon so much that uh my other son's got one and he's got a one year old and they love to play together. I don't know, they're fun. But how do you house break them, serendipity? How do do you, are they how do you <laughs> Yeah they should chill up poop everywhere? No, they have a litter that you put a litter box in their um cage. And most of them are pretty good about using the litter box because they just they the don't... key word here is <laughs> Christopher most <laughs> most, most. Of them. so yeah. it's a roll the dice, buddy. <laughs> yeah, most of them are pretty good. We honestly we didn't really do anything to litter train him. We just stuck the litter box in the cage, and it just kind of became where he preferred to go. Christopher, so there is a cage. I would get a post nuptial agreement, brother. Yes. Before you get the chinchilla. Uh, <laughs> yes. You want to keep, you want to have like a rabbit cage or something um, for them to stay in when you can't watch them because they're, they're rodents. They're going to be chewers, Chris. Oh, oh, wait a minute. We're about to buy a bunch of furniture for our house. It's yeah. A bad idea. Oh, they'll well, be chewers of the word, not doers of the word. The <laughs> Sorry, I'm just. I'm yeah, just I was gonna say I have a really nice Bible, Bible too. Is Sheldon it gonna chew on my stays. Bible? Yeah, Sheldon stays in the rabbit cage unless somebody's like playing with him. His name Sheldon. Him. Yep. <laughs> Pretty so awesome. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're killing your room by talking about chinchillas for twenty minutes. Sorry. Right? I mean, I was trying to think about something to relate it to God. I don't know. I mean, oh, I mean, dude, the right Bethel Reading meltdown is in full swing. Have you seen anything about this? Not at all. What What's going on? Oh, snap. So, like, the adult children of adult the... Adult children. Like, the adult children of the, like, like the elders at Bethel Reading okay. are, like, sharing their secrets and, like... I mean, these people are all, like, really bad. Like, it's really so bad. I, there's, like, okay. sexual abuse and there's, like... All kinds Can of things that went on. Can you bring us up to date on. there, Christopher? Because, like, I don't know what you're talking well, about. What, Who yeah, so... People? Okay. Well, yeah. Oh, hey, again, okay. Okay. So you're saying like the the first people like going all the way back to like the the NAR like the the Bill what what's the guy's name the Bill the main guy Bill Johnson. Yeah. Okay. So like him and his like senior staff and like the people up and coming with him, um, yeah. all of their offspring who are now adults, um, they're saying about all the stuff that's going on. My question first of all is, are these people still like saying they're Christians? Yeah. And they're sharing the secrets, or are they like all like atheists now, and they've turned against it, and they're sharing their secrets? No, no, there. they're they're a bunch of Christians um, that okay. are like friends with Costi Hinn. So I don't know if you know who Costi Hinn is, but like no. Benny Hinn's. Oh nephew. yeah, yeah. Who told all the stuff about him? Yeah. So like, and you know Benny Hinn's at Bethel Redding. So so Connie, there's a church oh. out in California in Red. I don't know where the heck Redding, California is. You, you it's probably the, do. Actually, not that mountain. far from me. Oh, it's, it's like not. It's, it's north of me, yeah. That's okay, so so Re Bethel Reading is like a huge mega church that is part of the New Apostolic Reformation that ha is led by Bill Johnson, um, and they've just had a bunch of crazy stuff. They're they're the church where they blow glitter out of the AC system, and then are like, "Hey, it's gold dust from heaven," or they blow like chicken feathers out, and they're like, "That's angels' wings." Like, I'm not kidding. They, like, actually did these things. There's video. <laughs> Benny Hinn. I don't know. Um, I have a horror story about Redding, California, but I won't bore you with it. But um, it, it was, uh, like, a, a, a one man, you know, the, the big guy in town who had the only trucking company that had the only business uh, that kept the town alive. I'm not surprised that they moved there because it was per pretty isolated, but I wouldn't want to live there. It's very, 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 very hot in the summertime. It's yeah, very dry. Course. I went there once. Um, I, I, oh man, you got a lot of feedback. Um, I, I went there once when we were when we were in Humboldt County. I had to cross the mountains and like go there because there's this um, order I was picking up, and uh, I didn't want to wait for delivery, so I like went to the store. 
And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's exactly what Connie said. I think it's like an hour, what, north of Sacramento. But Chris, yeah, so what's what's your story? So you, you gave a setup, like it's all these adult children coming out and telling how corrupt or whatever scandalous it is. So what are the uh, what are the scandals? Just like run of the run of the mill, like power, sex, drugs, money, or any anything particularly more noteworthy than that? Sorry, I'm like transitioning over to the diner. <laughs> Are you getting the diner's Wi-Fi? No, I don't use foreign Wi-Fis. Because you can afford the data plan. <laughs> I mean, aren't all data plans unlimited at this point? Uh, yeah, uh, well, um, they'll, they'll throttle. So like if it's not a truly unlimited one, after you use like your gigs of high speed, then it like, you know, it says it's unlimited, but it's like 2G and you basically can't do anything with that. Anyways, uh, yes, go on. Uh, so your story, what are the what are the juicy scandals? Unless you're still in transition. All right, well, while we wait, that was a cliffhanger. Connie, am, am I right? Isn't Redding uh, just like north of Sacramento a little bit? Yeah, it's it's a ways north, you know. I just don't like going there. Had a really bad experience in, in Redding. It's a the further north you go, the further rural you get. The crazier the people are, because a lot of people that that um, we had that problem here where I live too. A lot of people, um, you know, would come into their rural areas to do things that they couldn't do in a more congested area. So, and and those people can be pretty crazy. Speaking from a retired UPS gal's perspective. Well, so like the UPS routes uh, got crazy. Oh my gosh! Last night we had a we had to have a, a trapper here. Um, I was walking. How did I not lead with that? We, we, was, I was it for, my, was it first serendipity's chinchilla? If by chinchilla you mean like eight and a half foot alligator? Yes. So I was walking outside to uh, to take my dog out. Um, and it was like, it was like nine. We were like getting ready for, uh, it's, it's the last time he goes out at night. So I walk out and there's like a, there's like a two police cars a sh or like a sheriff's van. And, um, these two cops are just standing in my neighbor's driveway. And, uh, I go out and my neighbor is like, uh, had a flashlight. He's like, don't come over here. Don't come over here. I'm like, what's going on? I'm like who got murdered? Um, anyway, uh, the cops didn't think that's funny. Um, but they're like, look, look. And I had my little dog with me. And uh, I could just look in his driveway, like right at the front door of my neighbor's house was this giant alligator. It was just chilling, just sitting there. I'm like, oh, oh dang. I'm like, how did, uh, how did my neighbor find out about that? He's like, he tried to take his dog, which is like a real small dog, uh, outside. And, uh, you know, he opened the door and was met with that. So he runs back in and, you know, calls me and, you know, we get the police here. So um, then they had to like wait for like an hour while this trapper shows up. And they ended up like, I think, chasing it behind the pond my, behind my house. And I, I don't know if they ever caught it or not, but it was late and I just went to bed. You have a I mean, pond behind your house that that has alligators in it. Oh, yeah. It's the best security ever. Like, yeah, we... <laughs> it's an alligator yeah. moat. Like, they usually hang... I mean, it's usually like one giant alligator per pond because if there's more than that, they, they fight. So, per, I mean, there's ponds everywhere and pretty much every pond will have at least one alligator uh, unless it's, uh, you know mommy and daddy alligator that love each other very much. But yeah, I've got like a preserve and a pond. So like usually there's a, there's a big alligator. I don't know if it's that one that hangs out on the other side of the bank. Just every day is out there just sunbathing. Connie, there's literally alligators everywhere. It's like, have you ever played that old game pitfall where you like walk <laughs> on the alligator head? That's what living in Florida is like. I did live in Florida for a while in 1972, and um, everything that moves bites you. I could go outside to hang up the clothes, and I would have huge bite marks on me from from just hanging up clothes. Yeah, I didn't like it. I didn't like Florida. I didn't like well, the weather. Step off the airplane. If you've never been time. to Florida, step off the airplane, and the, the, the smell of of everything rotting hits you in the face. You get used to it 
when you're there, but when you just come right off of an airplane, it should have been my first clue. But I did like it. It was a short jump to the Bahamas. So if you guys ever go to the Bahamas, go to Harbor Island. It's the only pink beach in the world. It's beautiful. Um, it's it's a very small island, very gorgeous. Chris, Can are, we are you bring pet alligators what, to it? What about Bethel? Like squirrel. <laughs> oh, sorry. So so what's happening right now is that uh, there's a couple of people that are giving their testimonies, and you know about Mike Mike Bickle and the Kansas City Prophets melting down at the same time. So these are Not all like all. okay. So these are all big NAR people, okay? And like now, the Mike Bickle has admitted to like raping kids, um, and he's like one of the main NAR prophets. Um, and uh, yeah. It's like really, like really one bad. Of the true eleven or whatever. Do I know? Did you say there were like uh, whenever they did the NAR thing? There was like eleven new prophets. Is he one of like those original? He was. Movies? Yeah. Well, he was a little bit before the day of infamy in two thousand eight because everybody in two thousand eight turned out to be a charlatan and a liar. But he was before that, so he was in the eighties and nineties, um, and they ran the International House of Prayer. The IHOP. Oh, I remember that. IHOP was bad. I never knew anything. I mean, I knew, I knew it was like a Christian thing that was kind of popular. Yeah, I, I mean, around me. so there were like IHOP children being abused in prayer rooms. Like the testimonies coming out, and it's like I can't even talk about most of it because it's just so, just so heinous. And uh, so apparently Bethel had the same problems, and now um, one of the main people that was both with IHOP and Bethel were very close. So they shared a lot of teachers and stuff. And so, um, they're, they're coming out now and basically like all of the stuff that they were like, quote unquote, prophesying, um, there was a whole army of researchers that were essentially doing behind the scenes research on anybody they were giving a prophecy to. And, finding out about them. And then when social media came out, it became much easier. So like what they would do before is they would have these people fill out comment cards about like, Oh, what is your problem? What is, what do you want us to pray for about? And then they would take those cards and match them with the people. And, you know, they would be like, Hey, is there, you know, Sally Joe in the audience and Sally Joe, you've got this back problem. And the Lord is telling me right now that you've got this back problem. And it's like, yeah, it's like that kind of thing. And so they, so these adult children are exposing all of their father's lies, and it's like getting really, it's getting really crazy. And where is all this coming out at? Like Protestia or, or some other? It's thing all on Twitter. It's like the, oh. yeah, it's like all on Christian Twitter, and it's all over the place. And there's like a whole thread. I can, well, you don't have Twitter, but like, I could, and I just read. I don't ever post on Twitter, but like. Um, but yeah, I can send you the threads. They're crazy, man. Like, I mean, just like the details that they're giving are just like insane. Well, Chris, did you hear? I I know you went to the um, uh, what you call it, the Ark, um, exhibit for you know, yeah, that was in Genesis. Awesome. Did you hear that uh, their next venture is that they're going to recreate um, modern uh, first century Jerusalem? They're going to do like a, a recreation of first century Jerusalem with the temple. Yep. Yeah, it's going to be a scale model. I mean, it's not going to be full size because that would take up miles. But like, no, yeah. no, they're they're talking about it being full. Full size. I mean, they, they talked about it while I was there. Um, I think it's one quarter size. Like, really? Yeah. Because, I mean, think about it. Like, the temple would be, like, 20 stories tall. And, like, what? I mean, yeah, no. the temple was huge. The temple's not tall. Oh, no. it's not. No. Dude, it's, like, 200 feet tall. What are you talking about? No. The <laughs> temple? <laughs> yeah, no. I, I mean, I, I could be mistaken, but the actual, like, 
the measurements of the temple are in the scripture. My I God. Know, I know. Quick I Google, why don't you do a quick AI and tell us how big the temple was? This, this is a... Do Herod's Yeah, because I know the measurements are there, and, like, it's not... No, right, it's not... It's, it's like, miles. really big, you guys. I'm pretty sure it's, like, really no, big. No, you're wrong. Hold on. Temple measurements. Well, you got to be careful, because there's ones in Ezekiel of, like, the heavenly temple. I'm talking about, like, what was the size Solomon's. of Herod's I'm temple? I'm talking about Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple. That's fine, Solomon's temple, or Herod's temple. We, whichever yeah. one, it doesn't matter. Like, the one that we can actually go to and see, like... The big stones. I mean, dude, some of these stones are the size of Volkswagens, man. Well, yeah, I, I agree with that, but not. A, not I mean, they don't stack them up to make two hundred feet of those. Well, I don't know. Yeah. What's that. Okay. No. Um. Hold on. Temple measurements. Here we go. All right. I just re all I what, remember is the last time I looked okay, it up, I was length, shocked by yeah, how big. Yeah. Okay. It was. Okay. So. The length is about 90 feet, the width is about 30 feet, and the height uh, is not explicitly mentioned in the Bible. However, some scholars estimate its height, height was based on other ancient structures and archaeological principles. Um, yeah, so in that, that's what I remember of the Bible. Like it, it was not a – and then there's like the inner court and the outer court and stuff like that. So right. that, 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 that would be the actual temple, but even with the outer courts and all that stuff, like – it's it's not like miles and, and like you know twenty no, story skyscrapers. It's one level. It, it's very humble. Yeah, it's one uh, level. I mean the the courts are huge too because they have yeah, all the those thousands of bull, bulls and all that <clears throat> stuff. Correct, because you know for, particularly for the mandatory observance of the three feasts, um, where it was mandatory that they observe, like the the courts are huge. Um, but no, the temple, it's only one level. Uh, let's see, in addition. Mm, well, uh, so to, what, what is the maximum height that people think it was? Uh, it doesn't seem to, it, it seems it was based on other ancient structures. So find whatever around Jerusalem or, or the area. Josh, Dr. Josh, if you know this, uh, around that area, what would the highest structures be? And probably like that i mean everything was stacked on stone so i mean it, it's probably what it'd have a maximum of like i don't know um without it crumbling i i, I don't even know um, okay hang on in addition the dimensions in main salmon simple um the outer courts were an integral part da, da, da. uh the outer yeah, courts, dr bowen was just saying herod's temple was much larger than solomon uh okay we'll check that in a minute the dimensions okay. of the outer court are not explicitly provided in the biblical account, but there, it was significantly larger than the temple. Okay, fine. Uh, courtyard and priest within the outer court. There is a Disney area known as the courtyard. Um, so they're not specifically mentioned. Okay, let's see. What um, What about? What about Herod's? Temple right. Plus, there was like tunnels under Herod's temple that they've discovered. Like, there's all kinds of craziness, man. Okay, so. Okay, okay, this is this is better for you, Chris. It's still not miles, but um, okay. So, Herod's temple, um, which encompasses the temple. Okay, so this is the entire, uh, the entire enclosure, like the entire mount, um, would be. 500 meters, so like 1,600 feet and uh, from east to west and about 1,000 feet from north to south. The main temple building would be about 148 feet long and 92 feet wide, so not super huge. But okay, yeah, so so you've got your the entire court area would be about 1,640 feet by 1,000 feet. 60 cubits long, 20 wide, and 30 high. Yeah. 30 what high meters? Cubits. So a cubit is 18 inches. So let's see. Yeah, I just did the conversion. Like 90, yeah. Like all, all the cubit things, it just it spit out cubits, but also did the conversion. Right. So it would be 60 feet tall. That's still really tall. I got 45 feet. It's significantly less than 20 stories. 
Yeah. What is it, 10 foot a story? So maybe about four yeah. stories? Right, like, I was saying like 200 feet. It turns out to be like between 45 and 60. Yeah. Sounds great. Yes, please. Uh, strawberry, please. Well, that was fun. So, uh, what's on <laughs> you all's agenda for today? Mm -hmm. Anyone what? pay attention to the primaries last night? I got a... So what? Anyone pay attention to the primaries last night? I mean, is there a reason to? Not it really. Super Tuesday, baby. Just trying to get someone to talk about something. Mm. I mean... Hmm. Oh, there was something else. Um, check Protestia, uh, Nate. Because there's a couple juicy things on there, I remember. I just don't remember specifically what it was. All right, let's see. Protestia. Protestia. All right. We have Liberty University agrees to pay 14 million for concealing um, underreporting sexual abuses. Um, Jory Micah says she's no longer uh, she no longer believes the official Holocaust story. Um, still, really hates Zionists. Uh, former leader of United Methodist Church caught drawing swastika on neighbor's property. That's not good. Um, ELCA Conference of Bishops calls for permanent bilateral ceasefire in Gaza. Eh. Any of those? Um, Lutheran College holds... Oh, here's a good one. Maybe this. Lutheran College holds drag event featuring alumni performers, 300 plus students in attendance. Mm. United Methodist Church budget will be tiny after mass exodus from denomination. Atheist group asks IRS to strip tax exempt status from megachurch after political endorsement from the pulpit that should not be tied whatsoever to tax exemptions uh, religious organization institution separation of church and state um doesn't it, it means the government it means the government can't impose that against the church it doesn't mean the church is not supposed to be barred from having a political speech so maybe it's not the best form maybe they shouldn't be calling for uh, endorsements or whatever but if they want to that's perfectly fine um all right, that's all. That's all the ones in what's, the. What's really funny about that one is that like no one ever grouses about African American churches doing political endorsements, which they constantly do. Like, now Joe Biden comes speak and like all this stuff at big African American mega church. No one ever is like, oh yeah, we got to take away their church, their tax exempt status. <laughs> <laughs> it only goes one way. Yeah, it always only goes one way. What way is that far right, Christopher? <laughs> Always goes out the right wing. It's almost like they're afraid of something. The truth? The light? Yep. Yeah. Hmm. I think there'd be more uh, conversation stored up since uh, were you guys on clubhouse yesterday? I mean, the Jory Michaels thing is pretty significant. Like, she was a big, she was like a big Beth Moore, like ladies teacher type person, and then she went like crazy left and lost most of her quote unquote ministry at that point. Well, would you say it's a good thing because there shouldn't have been a ministry in the beginning? Oh, no, I totally believe in women's ministry. Like, like How would you say that? What, was it a women's ministry? Or I mean, I just assume that it was like a whole, you know, the way you would not endorse. No, it was it was definitely a women's ministry like that more. But I was, oh, okay. started wanting to branch out, like, 
you know, be like Beth Moore. I don't know who Beth Moore is. Of course I don't. Hey, Aaron, what's up, Aaron? Hey, not too much. Um, actually, I, I your, your conversation uh, made me think about something this weekend. I was thinking about women in ministry. I know that's uh, some people have strong opinions on this. Some say that women wouldn't, shouldn't be, well, I think pastors. But I've been trying to understand biblically where that, where those lines are, right? Uh, yeah, so there's two really good places. Like everyone, for, for whatever reason, everyone always focuses on the part where like Paul says like women should be silent in church, and they base their argument on lady pastors from that. When that that's it's crazy. Like there, there's two places in what James and Titus, where it very clearly lays out the qualifications for uh for like elders or overseers or pastors, and it, it says something. So James and Titus, they basically say the same thing that you need to be a husband of one wife. So if we're taking the Bible at its word, it says husband. Chicks can't be husbands. So, I mean, if we're really following the letter of the scripture, it says husband of one wife. So the people for it, uh, for women pastors, will be like, well, no, it's fine. It just means, you know, you have to be married. So, you know, if you're, if you're a husband, you have to have a wife. If you're a wife, you have to have a husband. But that's not strictly what the Bible says. The Bible says you need to be the husband of one wife. So if you're the husband of two wives, guess what? Can't be a pastor. Um, and it also says, you know, you need your children need to be like, you know, um, you need to be respectable in the community. So, if you know, if you're not a respectable, you know, have it together, like, you know, well seasoned person in the community can't be a pastor. Um, and, you know, it talks about how their children need to be like orderly and disciplined and, you know, not like a, a raging terror. So if you're a pastor or if you're a husband of one wife and you have kids who are unholy nightmares, can't be a pastor. Uh, that type of thing. So, I mean, if you if you strictly just go by what the Bible says, um, no, sorry. Like most people on earth are, do not meet the qualifications for pastor. Men, women, doesn't matter. Most of them don't meet all those requirements. Uh, but the ones you do, you need to you know, be in good standing in your community. You need to have respectful kids. You need to have your family and your household under control. Um, and you need to have a wife. And you need to be a dude. Um, so, yeah, you can find those in James and Titus. Chris, anything to add? Exactly. Or James, or Aaron, or okay, thank you. I have to look. Yeah, do you have the yeah, exact yeah, verse, Chris? I, I guess there's an... uh, Chris, were you saying the exact reference so, so we can Yeah, 1 Timothy 3 and um, Titus 1. Uh, yeah, Aaron, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to go to Timothy as well. I, I got 1 Timothy 2, uh, I think it's about 2.12. Um, it's men and women in well, the church. Well, yeah, I mean, that just prohibits women from being teachers. But the qualifications that Nate's talking about are after that. Let's be really clear. It doesn't prohibit women from being teachers at all. It prohibits women from teaching men. Yeah. That's what the prohibition's on. Because my wife teaches women. She has a seminary yeah. degree. And to be clear, like we're talking about overseers, right? So even even before we're talking about men and stuff, like if if you're an overseer, if you're a pastor, you're in charge of the whole the, the whole church, which is going to include men, women, and kids. So so you know to to be the shepherd of this flock, you have to be a guy. I I mean I guess unless there's a church where all the men have gone off to war and died, and you know they're they're it's just 100% women. Well, no, you still can do it, right? Because I mean that's it's regardless of the congregation. It's the qualification. So if you have that title, pastor, gosh, I, I do that every single time, Chris. <laughs> every single time I do that, and then I catch myself. Because no, it doesn't. E even if it was a church of only women, you still couldn't have that title because that that requirements in order to get that title of pastor, you need to f fulfill those requirements. So if you're a woman, you cannot fulfill those requirements. Therefore, even if it's just a group of women, you can't be a pastor. You can be, I, I guess, like. A person who, you know, like, uh, like, what's the verse where it says, you know, old women train the younger women? I mean, you could be like an, an instructor, a teacher of that level um, to the other women, but you, you can't be a pastor. And then when they're like, women were prophetesses and women were judges. Great. Be a prophetess. Be a judge. But you can't be a pastor. <laughs> well, yeah, like the Deborah thing, 
Like yeah. people don't understand judges. It's like, no, Deborah was a judgment on the house of Israel. <laughs> like she was literally a judgment on them and she says as much. So a, a pastor will minister, right? But so others can others minister without being a pastor? Of course. Well, we're all carry, uh, you know, we're all called to, you know, part, be part of the Great Commission. So, like, I mean, and that's where people get like their hackles up. They're like, "Oh, it's the patriarchy." Blah, 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 blah. You know what's more important than being a pastor? Uh, the, being a part of the Great Commission. So, every single person, man, woman, child, everyone, is called to be a part in the greatest thing anyone can be a part of, which is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, just can't be a pastor. So, yeah, I mean, right. women, there's kids, a distinction. everyone. There's a distinction between leading a flock and simply partaking and in, in sharing in the gospel. Because, I mean, there are examples in the scripture where uh, husbands and wives minister and share the gospel with other men. And the wives are particularly a part of that. So it's not that women aren't capable of, um, you know, sharing the gospel with men i just women just don't have a place in leading a flock yeah like if dippity wanted to go set up a chinchilla thing like boot of chinchilla petting booth outside walmart and you know when people came out they're like oh i'll pet your chinchilla i'd be like have you heard the gospel of jesus christ (laughs) um that's totally fine yeah (laughs) okay so like why don't you have a chinchilla petting booth dippity (laughs) uh what Aaron? I'll say at my church is normally a lead pastor and there's another pastor and they'll, they'll do the service, but sometimes they have a guest speaker and it's a, it's a lady and she does a great job. She stands up there and she, she gives, I guess she ministers, right? But she doesn't have the title of pastor. They just bring her in as a guest speaker. Yeah. Welcome does. to my world. My church does the same thing. And that's where Chris gets into talking about, well, still she's teaching over men, like an official capacity. She's teaching men. Yeah, that's bad. Well, let me just, yeah, let me let me just read these two things. It's only a couple of verses, um, so I got the actual citations. Um, okay, so this was in First Tim First Timothy three one and seven. Here is a trustworthy saying: Whoever aspires to be an overseer, pastor, desire, desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach not giving into drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. And he must not do so in a manner. uh, And he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must be, he must not be a recent convert or he may be become conceited and fall into the same judgment as the devil. So in first Timothy three, one and seven, we've got 14 requirements. Only one of those has to do with sex. So 14 requirements. Um, In Titus, it's basically the same thing, but Titus 1, 5 to 9. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might be put in order. um, The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder uh, must be blameless. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered, not a drunkard, not violent, or pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable one who loves what is good, one who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by the sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. So there's 13 requirements, um, and they're basically the same ones as First Timothy. So pastors, elders, and then I think the one you were talking about, Second Timothy 2, 24 and 26. Um, let's see. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful opponents, must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to uh, knowledge of the truth, and they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Um, so, so I mean, those are like straight up the requirements. So I, I'm still waiting. I, I mean, I haven't gone on a mission, like knocked on all the, the pastor's church's doors who, you know, have women pastors or co-lead women pastors and ask them for a full justification. I mean, so, you know, maybe that's on me. But, I mean, whenever I have heard them kind of uh, quickly explain it, like when, whenever, like, they're in a sermon talking about it and then they'll kind of quickly explain um, over it, they'll either use, like, the, the context of Paul where he's saying women shouldn't talk in church, and they'll explain how, which I, I, I agree with their explanation, 
but that's not what we're talking about here. It's a different category. Um, how it was like, you know, men and women would sit in different sides of the aisle. So like when the women didn't understand something in church, uh, they were basically cross talking across the aisle, asking their husbands. He's like, Hey, don't talk in church, wait till you get home, then ask your husband. I'm like, well, that's fine. I can buy that, but that has nothing to do with pastors. So they'll either go down that train of thought or they'll talk about, you know, the, how Deborah was a prophetess and, you know, or a judge and, you know, Phoebe was a prophetess or whatever, all the, all this. And I'm like, well, great judges, prophetesses, still not a pastor. Um, or the last one they'll do is in Joel, like, you know, in my last days, I'll pour out my spirit and, you know, young men will see visions and old men will dream dreams. And, you know, I'll pour out my, on my sons and my daughters. Um, I'm like, great. What's that got to do with being a pastor? Nothing. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I really want a good explanation, um, which I think those might be them. That may be the best they have, but I, ears are open. Like, g- give me the best reason you have for why women could be pastors, because it seems like unless you can really thread that needle, the Bible is directly saying the opposite. Are you in a similar place, Chris? Well, I mean, I know you're not like waiting for an explanation like it's going to change your mind, and neither am I. But I mean, I, I want to hear what they say. It's like, you know, do your best job as uh, making a steel man position um, so then we don't have to like, you know, tear down a straw man. Yep. No, I mean, like in one of those hallway chats, you know, that, that you hate, um, <laughs> this dude comes in, <clears throat> Dr. Nico, right? He just finished his doctorate in systematic theology from Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. He actually said it like that. And the dude was like, well, the scholars realized that Paul didn't write Colossians, Ephesians, First and Second Timothy, and Titus. So they shouldn't be in the canon. That's what that dude replied with for egalitarianism. I'm not even oh. kidding. <laughs> so I just get rid of the Bible to make it okay. That's literally what he replied with, bro. I'm not even kidding. What was the guy's name? Dr. Nico. He hangs out with all the, like, hyper-charismatic NAR people and, like, tries to give them a fig leaf of theology, and it's, like, really embarrassing. Huh. Uh, any any follow-up, Aaron? Um, yeah, I guess... I, I think I heard Chris say that he, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but like women can minister, that's fine. But you seem to think that as soon as that's being done to the whole congregation, right, on Sunday morning, instead of the pastor in place of there's a woman there, is that kind of where you draw the line? Like once they're on stage and they're, they're giving the service, is that where you say now they're doing something that only pastors? Correct. Yeah. So like women are commanded to teach. Like, there's no, like, women can teach. Women are commanded to teach. Um, it's just that they're commanded to teach a specific audience. Like, I believe in women. Te- like I said, my wife is a woman teacher. Like, she went to seminary and the whole nine. Like, she teaches women's Bible studies. She's 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 excited because she only has a couple more months of going through First Peter verse by verse before she feels like she's confident enough to teach through it. Just to give you an idea. Well, and even to the extent of like limiting the audience, I think I think the primary thing that scripture focuses on is that women um, are not permitted to teach or exercise authority over men in church. Like the scripture very specifically says in church. Um, well, but where would they hold authority over men besides church? Well, I don't think that women were intended to hold authority over men, period. I mean, well, God says right. women were made to submit to man. But, um, but what I'm saying is that there are also examples in scripture of women specifically, you know, correcting men. Um, uh, Priscilla, you know, um, there, there were examples in scripture of, of women privately correcting men on, on their teaching. So I don't, I don't think it's that, you know, I think that in the setting of outside of church, you know, either in the vein of witnessing or even like private home studies, I think that, you know, women are perfectly capable of um, participating and interjecting in, in that context. I just don't think I do agree that, like, in the church setting, I don't think a woman should be standing up at the pulpit giving a message. 
to a mixed audience. Right, like my wife will participate in group Bible studies and stuff, but she's also not teaching that Bible study, you know, to a mixed group. You know what I'm saying? Like she'll she'll participate and be like, hey, by the way, let's do some exegesis. Um, this is what this means. Um, but again, she's she doesn't you she doesn't take the role teaching? as the teacher. No, that's not teaching. That's just participating. Like, I mean, you could, I mean, it sounds semantical, but like, you know, teaching is a specific role. Like, you know, one of the problems with modern evangelicalism is that we blur the lines between teachers and facilitators. Um, and so, you know. It does feel a little semantic. <laughs> well, but like, I think that's because of our modern culture. I don't think that it's semantic in the scripture. Like there wouldn't, like Priscilla and Aquila, for instance, they're mentioned as a couple, Priscilla mm -hmm. is never mentioned without Aquila. Yeah, that's that's so, true. So, like, you know, the idea that Priscilla is mm -hmm. out there teaching is simply not supported by the scripture. She is under the headship of her husband, and whatever she's doing, she's doing under his headship. You know, because, I mean, like, look, the patriarchy is good and right and biblically sound, and this is what God has given us is the patriarchy. And so to rebel against the patriarchy in any way is to rebel against the God of the Bible. And also, I wouldn't conflate, um, you know, a correction, depending on what you're talking about, with, um, with authority necessarily. So, like, you know, if Chris is leading a Bible study and he's like, you're ignorant, read a book. Um, like, this is clearly what Hebrews whatever says. And Chris's wife's like, uh, hey, Chris, hey, Chris, uh, maybe, you know, be mindful of your tone. And, uh, you know, it actually says and not the. You're like, oh, ha, ha, I, I need my old man reading glasses. You're right. My bad. I, I apologize. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I mean, a little correction I don't think would, would be equivalent to authority either. It's like, you know, when a kid in, in school uh, maybe corrects a teacher who's like misreading something or, or whatever, has a brain, you know, brain spaz. Um, you wouldn't say, well, they're holding authority over the teacher, yet they offered a correction. Uh, but if they're like, you know, giving them like a big public correction, like, no, you're, you need to read a book because this, blah, blah, blah then it, it could get into that. But just on its face, I wouldn't say all correction equals like some sort of authority. In my humble opinion. Or not. Maybe I'm just kidding. I don't know. Hello? Did the internet go up? <laughs> You're still Sorry, there. I'll be with you in a second. Sorry, Nate, I'm just leaving the diner. I was paying while you were talking to me. No dining dash? Oh, I don't steal the fruits of other people's labor. The official position of asking Christians don't dine and dash. I was just kidding. I try to make jokes sometimes. Probably shouldn't. I enjoy your jokes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so does that make sense, Aaron? Like, I mean, again, like, the, the whole, like, feminist thing has really infected our culture and there's a brand and i always talk about books there's a brand new book out that is really good um it is aria butterfield does it, and i know nate's not going to know this but maybe deputy does does it, has anybody ever heard of rosaria butterfield i've heard you i do know something about it from your teaching not from my reading right so she is a former lesbian women's studies professor who got saved and uh, is now the wife of a pastor and a grandmother. Um, and so um, she wrote a famous book called The Kingdom of God Comes with a House Key, or I think the gospel comes with a house key. It's very good. It talks about her conversion. Um, and uh, she has a book out, just came out like a couple of weeks ago called, sorry, um, it just came out a couple of weeks ago. It is called Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age. And she directly takes on um, feminism in the church as well as how um, the patriarchy has been put down. Um, and she went from being a lesbian women's studies professor to fully believing and promoting the patriarchy. It's hilarious. 
And also, too, that's another, like, I think that's another lie that kind of creeps in when people want to talk about, oh, it's the patriarchy and men are oppressive and blah, 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 blah. And their angle is, no, you need to make women equal in every way and blah, blah, blah. It, it's, it's not. Like, if you, if you read the people, like, there's a living that will go along with it who buy into it. Um, but, like, the people who are really pushing those narratives, it's more subversive. Like, it's not to empower women. That's what they say. Uh, but is to, like, you know, subvert um, biblical principles. Like, more times than not, if you dig into it, it gets back to the Christian God of the Bible. So even though Islam is way more, like, you know, repressive or patriarchal than anything Christianity would ever do, um, like, we, we're talking about it, right? So even though, like, other religions and other cultures would be way more repressive, um, they still base their, their stuff on the God of the Bible, almost like it's a battle between Satan and the actual God, um, you know, of the universe, which is the Christian God. Um, so even though there's better examples, if they truly wanted equality for women to fight against, uh, they somehow have to pick the God of the Bible and Christians to fight against. Um, so it's, it's always to subvert Christianity. And whenever you get back to it, like this will come out in the writings. Um, I, I, I can't think of any names, but I just I listen to lots of, of um, you know, history and stuff about this in different podcasts. And it's super interesting um, how, how the lines like kind of blur between between like religion and politics to some of these things like these deep, deep seated things that have been like set up generations ago. And um, anyway, Chris, can, can you uh, do any name drops or are you familiar with what I'm talking about? Because it's not just about, Oh, let's like, let's let women be equal. It's, it's like, we're going to say it's to let women be equal because that's going to, you know, hit the emotional appeal and get people on our side, but it's really to subvert the Christian God and the power structure that God has put in place. Well, I mean, that is the feminist movement. I mean, it started with Betty Friedan and, you know, the first wave of feminism, you know, and, and you know, that, that whole group, you know, feminine mystique, um, Gloria Steinem, all that stuff. I mean, that, that has so fully infected the church that, like, when I say the patriarchy is good and right and instituted by God, and I say that at church, people freak out. Like, <laughs> How often do you say that at church? <laughs> like, do you I show on Sunday the patriarchy is good? <laughs> the patriarchy is good and right and instituted by God. What are you talking about? And then they'll be like, "Huh?" Oh. But you see, if you, you have a lot of you have a lot of friends at church. Yes, I do. <laughs> they they enjoy my frank nature. So you just change your name to Frank. I should. Yeah. Hey, I mean, Michael. How is the beach? Oh, it sucks to be back. Uh, I, I mean, not terribly. Like, I also, you know, sitting in a kin, tin can at 40,000 feet with a couple of sick people, I'm fighting a ah. cold now. <clears throat> so, but no, I mean, it was it was terrible. The, the mornings were around 72, and it got up to about 86 or so with very little humidity and a little bit of a breeze. So, yeah, it was uh, it was pretty spectacular. Well, all right. Oh, you mean like us. every day that Nate and I wake up? <laughs> yeah, but you wake up in Florida. I was just telling him about the giant alligator outside last night, my neighbor's house that they had to come get. Yeah, 100% fewer alligators in uh, where I was. There were lots of coatis, which are um, like basically Mexican raccoons. <clears throat> and uh, we saw a couple of spider monkeys at the resort as well. Huh. Um, do, the, but, do the Mexican uh, raccoons like wear cute little hats? I'm just going to pretend you didn't say that. Wow. I'm just going to pretend you didn't say that. Um, yeah, so, you, can, you don't have to pretend. This is cool. I'm going to say it again. Yeah, uh, that's that's fine. You know, these these things are, are, you know, recorded for posterity, and you're the one that has to live with it, so I don't care. Yeah, um, yeah. Good so, yeah, so Chris, I'm, I'm concerned. Have you have you dumped this um, dishonest train that you're, that you're on yet? Oh, free stuff. Oh, I don't know if I can do this today. I mean, I don't know what you mean. Yeah, like the, that you know, Nate Nate hit it like a like a ball peen hammer. Um, yeah, pretty sub. The most dishonest apologetic a person can engage in. That. Nah, it's not dishonest. It's really good. So it's dishonest. completely dishonest. Really so let me let me give you an example. So you so you think you start with God even though you don't. But let's say that for a second that that was actually the case. How honest is it to start with your conclusion on something? Exactly. 
It's very honest. Exactly. Like, really, it's honest to start. Really, Chris, yeah, you're a, Chris, yeah, you're a mass. There, there's a mass murderer loose in in Florida, and it's you. I've started with my conclusion. <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah. Well, then, great. Then I, then I can just disavow that because I'd be like, all right. Well, I haven't like killed anybody. Cool. So, I mean, your conclusion is incorrect. But like, the, if we don't start from the Christian worldview, like we but reviewed you don't. this a couple of weeks ago, right? We, but we do. So we reviewed this a couple of weeks ago, and the answer that we got back in terms of where consciousness comes from is a bunch of a bunch of atoms knocking up against each other. Sure. And okay. So let's. Okay. That, okay. So let's address that that's directly. Simply, that's simply. Re- yeah. That's like. That's like throwing out epistemology. It's throwing out right. metaphysics. It's just giving us a. It's giving us a non-answer. Right. Is is a is an is an is an inability at this present date. Is an inability to provide a suitable answer for you. Is that evidence for your position? Yes, because there it will, is. It, it is it, really. It is because it is a metaphysical question that will never ever be answered by material science. You can't it possibly know that. Yes, absolutely, I can know that because you, no, you can't possibly know that. A thousand years ago, a, okay, a thousand years ago, everybody thought that lightning came from gods. Okay, then we learn stuff, and we realize that's not the case. Okay, did you so know that both Christians did believe that. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That that actually pa- that actually pales in comparison to some of the stuff you believe. But my point is, is that in the in the history of history, in all of recorded history, every single solitary scrap of recorded history, there have yeah. been thousands upon thousands of things that we used to attribute to gods. Everything from fertility to lightning, uh, a good crop, uh, a good catch in a boat, all these things. Yeah. We we then learned we then learned that wasn't the case. But never, ever, ever in the history of all history ever has there been something that we that we found a scientific explanation for that we actually learned, oh you know what, actually that wasn't that that was God. Never happened. Never. Sorry, I, I got a phone call while you were talking in the last like thirty seconds. Okay. So what I said was is that there are lots of things we used to attribute to gods, lightnings, all these other things, right? But never, ever, ever, ever in all of recorded history, in the history of history, has there been something that we have a scientific explanation for that we later learned, oh, actually, you know what? That was God. Never, well, that ever happened. Hand, that goes never hand happened. In hand. Yes, that goes hand in hand what you were just saying. First of all, um, you asked Chris if it was dishonest to assume his conclusion in his, uh, in his opening. Um, and I'd say, well, you know, Yes, it's a bad. It may be you may say it's a bad reasoning. Don't hear me wrong, but if it's true, it's true. So you know, if you say, "Hey, I'm just going to assume Chris is a killer," um, I have no evidence. Well, I mean, it may be that you, you got to mute. There's a lot of feedback. Tons of. Feedback. Oh, sorry. So you may say it's dishonest um, a way of reasoning, but if it's true and he's a killer, he's a killer. Um, but then what you just said, you're like, it, it, you just said the inverse. So you made both points, a point and then you counterpointed, um, which you didn't tie together, but I will. So. You said it's dishonest because you're assuming with your conclusion, but then what you just said, you're like, have we ever, ever, ever found anything that we would call evidence for God? I mean, you didn't say you're assuming your conclusion, but I mean, that that kind of feels like that's what's happening. You're like, well, because we haven't assume, assumed a conclusion for God so far, uh, we're just going to assume that. So I mean, you didn't say you're assuming your conclusion, but it's definitely has that feel to it. Um, so I would say yet. Um, so the same way Chris, and you would say if he says he knows it, you know, perhaps your ears would be more acclimated to hearing that as he really, really believes it. This is his claim. So I, I don't know if that just helps the conversation keep moving forward. Um, even though he's like, yes, I know that I know that I know it. You're like, okay, he really, really, really believes it. Um, that's what I would say. to. Uh, to well, yeah, and that's, and that's fine. But the problem is, is that my viewpoint is subject to revision. And that is the problem, right? Really? It's it's a problem. It's a problem to be demonstrated. It's a problem to admit that you might be wrong. That's a no, problem, a, Chris. No, no, no. Hold on. It's a problem that you're attempting to base truth on subjectivity that is subject to change. And what I'm I never saying said is that. that. I never said that. I never said that. Okay. That that is putting words in my mouth. Truth is objective. Like there, there's a rock at the side of the road, whether I know about it or not. I never said truth is subjective. That's not correct. 
That's good. That's good. So we can start there. I mean, like, so I'm starting with truth is objective as well. It's just right. that I'm starting from the Christian worldview because no, I not. have revelation from God from outside of our subjective sense prison that tells me what truth is. Your basis for truth is borrowing from my basis of truth, and that's the problem. No, that's a yeserism. So, and I'll tell you why it's completely incorrect. Okay, I'm sorry. You, you do. Your senses are not objective. Okay, this is just so easily like. Wait, what like, isn't objective? Our senses are not objective, which oh, is. Oh yeah, I know that. I said our subjective right. sense prison. Sorry. Right, which is the only way we interact with the world. I'm sorry, but but this is just like so. You say. You say, if you don't start with a Christian worldview, and I've heard, I've heard this a billion times, and it's just so flatly incorrect. If you don't start with the Christian worldview, and like eventually you're going to get to this point, Chris. Eventually you're going to get to, if you don't start with a Christian Christian worldview, you can't make sense of anything. Which is, which is, so, utter, which is so utterly preposterous. It, it, it's, it's laughable. And the reason for that is because... This, this relevatory epistemology is still absorbed through your senses. Chris, it does, like it or not, and it doesn't matter what Matt Yester or uh, Redefined Living or anybody else tells you. It doesn't matter. They and you are wrong in this. The only way, the only way you interpret the world is through your senses. And it doesn't matter. Like, your opinion on this is irrelevant because it's incorrect. Okay, it's so incorrect. That, 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 it was it was my lane departure warning because there's a there's a new they're painting new lines. Okay, yeah. So anyway, um, I thought I, I thought I hit the timer or something. Um, no. <laughs> so here's why here's why what you just said was correct. Okay. Um, there are other things outside of our senses that we deal with in the world. Too. So for instance, reason is not one of our senses, and we process the information that we're given in the world through our reason. And we can process things that are not given to us in our senses with reason. And we don't have a tabula rasa when we are born. Like, humans are born with innate knowledge of certain things. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, through the process of evolution, I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so again, like, these things are not done through our senses. So the, so the, the idea that... The only thing that we have in our epistemology is through our senses. I mean, philosophers have, have like, said that that's a dumb idea for, like, 3,000 years. Like, when I mean, did I like say that, that, Chris? When did I say that? The only way that we can process information is through our five senses. That is not what I said. What I said is we oh. observe the world. We observe the world through our senses. And then, sure. through our senses, we employ reasoning. There is nothing. I am sorry. Can you give me an example of something you can process that doesn't come through your senses? Absolutely. Spiritual things. <laughs> There's no way. No, I'm sorry, but you still you still experience that through your senses. Oh, no, absolutely not. Like, my consciousness has nothing to do with my senses. If all of my senses were cut off, I would still be able to process thought. I would still be able to have, like, I'm getting no sensory input. Let's just put me in a sensory deprivation tank for two days. Do you, does my consciousness stop? Uh, no, your consciousness wouldn't stop in that instance. But, right. but you, but you but would I'm still... I'm not getting any sensory input, and yet I'm still making new thoughts. I'm, in fact, I'm probably, without all the noise of all the sensory input, I'm probably having much deeper thoughts and, and doing much better thoughts. So, like, I mean, the idea mm -hmm. that our, the only way that we are, like, going through the world is through our subjective senses outside of our reason is just not, it's not part of the science. Okay, that, that's interesting claim. Back that up. You, well, I mean, you, just, it, said, you it, just said it's it, not in the science. Back that up. Please cite me a paper. You, I mean, you just, have, you I've just stated you just stated I, that, I that, that it's absurd. God, I get it, I get it. You want, you know, no, I science is not my God. I don't have a deity. Yes, you do. Um, uh, yourself. So, you're, so, you're, just, you're just projecting onto me, Chris. No, I mean, like, everybody has a deity. Like, no, that's just, positively... The, no, I'm sorry. When did you gain access to my private mental states? 
uh, through revel through the revelation of God. Show me in the Bible. That. Show me in the Bible where it says that you have access to other people's private mental states. Romans one. No, th no. I'm sorry. That does not tell you you have access to my brain. That does not tell you you have access to my brain. That is a declaration which is absurd on its face. Well, the, there, Bi I mean, okay. there, the Bible well, I mean, is the claim. The Bible is the claim. The Bible is not the evidence. You cannot use the thing to prove the thing. Like you can't use the Bible to prove the Bible. You have to be able to have you have to be able to have a way of measuring it outside of that. And no. you positively no, do not. That's, that's the thing is I don't. Is this is Why not? divine revelation? Everything is measured through the Bible, not the other way around. Because the Bible that's an that's your through. assertion. That's right, your assertion. Comes, it doesn't matter because the Bible comes to us outside of our, as what I said 20 minutes ago, is outside of our subjective sense prism. The Bible is objective truth that we can know certain things that are true and fact based on that divine revelation. That epistemology and that metaphysics is the only thing by which the entire world makes sense. So, so unfortunate, and that's a yesterism too. So, unfortunately, you have no capacity to demonstrate the assertion that you just made. And the pro okay. and the bigger the bigger problem is is that is your your statement is the Bible is this objective fact. The problem is is that there are lots of things. There are too many things. There are boat loads of things that the Bible says that are not true in objective reality. Hang on, let me let me jump in here. Let, let me jump in here in my own room. Let, let me jump in here real fast in my own room if I can. So, Michael. This is, yeah. I, I'm going to be brief, so you can say it's open to interpretation or it's a torture sure, analogy, man. but I, I'm going to do this in like 20 seconds. So no for, for things, right? Like the Bible talks about how, you know, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And, you know, the Holy Spirit will live with Christians and give them, uh, lead them into truth and understanding. Um, it, and it talks a lot, like 1 Corinthians, read it all. 1 Corinthians, what, 14? Uh, talks a lot about spiritual discernment and how the natural man can't perceive, but with God, you know, all things are possible and you're being led into truth and understanding. So if, if you use verses kind of like that as a basis for what you're saying, like, how can you know? We're in the Bible. It's like a Muslim saying, where does Jesus say he's God? Where does Jesus say he's God? He says it in every way except perfect English like you want. So like, kind of like your question, like, where does the Bible say? Um, I, I just gave you the basis, right? So you can you can do with that what you want, but the goal is brevity or, or uh, uh, no, and, and I understand. So, and I understand that. I understand that completely. Uh, well, I'm, I'm a third done. So oh, okay. So there's, me, a scrip so, so there's a scriptural basis. The Bible also says, you know, uh, no one can say Jesus is Lord unless by the Holy Spirit. And that doesn't mean like you know you can say it right now for like a catchy YouTube video, but see if you're the Bible wrong. But like sincerely with the belief, right? So no one can say Jesus is Lord except you know the Holy Spirit allows them to say that, and then that person's saved. So you know, in a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways, things like that. So if you don't say Jesus is Lord, you're essentially at enmity at war with God. Okay, so that's point two. So the Bible gives us things that are spiritually discerned and says God Himself will like impart this to us. Then He says uh, certain things about people who are not Christians. Just for an example, you pick anything. I pick this one. So if you are not a Christian, you do not say Jesus is Lord with any sort of sincerity or, or religious conviction. Um, then there are certain things we know about that per that person per the Bible. They are at enmity, they are at war with God. So then, if we take these two things that the Bible says, you ask for Bible references, there you go. And then I say, okay, Michael, um, I'm going to observe Michael. Michael does not say Jesus is Lord. He says there is no God. He knows the Christian God is not true. Um, so that's what I know about Michael. Um, w without, without any physical, any sensory stuff like you're talking about, it's like just through, through consciousness, like to Chris's point. So the Bible says those things. I, I um, you know, know Michael has said that you know he doesn't believe you know in, in Christianity or God or anything like that, uh, the God of the Bible. So therefore, I believe Michael is at war with God. Um, and then what happens if uh, Michael actually talks and says uh, you know all these things? Like he could say, "I'm not at war with God. There is no God." Well, per the Bible, you know the fool said in his heart, "There is no God." So essentially, your your actions are saying you're at war with at war with God, even though your voice is saying, "Well, no, I can't be at war with something that doesn't exist." Um, anyway, so you could say that's labor, you could say it's torturous, but I was trying to be brief. There you go. No, man, you're all good, I pre and, I, and I appreciate it. Um, you, you and I seem to have a way of communicating pretty effectively, and I, I've always appreciated that. Um, yeah, uh, unfortunately, everything you just said, you did by, through, you did by way of and through your senses.
Well, and it was through it, it was through consciousness <clears throat> because it, it didn't get to my senses until it got to the part where you actually did what my consciousness kind of surmised you would your position would be um, through through no sensory except you know Chris's deprivation chamber experiment. So uh, it was all it was all thoughts in my consciousness. So I didn't get to sensory stuff until I actually observed what you really did. I, I understand. I understand what you're saying, but there's an, unfortunately, our we know that our brains don't work that way. Like, like there is, like, like it seems to be, like, to the best of our knowledge, and you know, and unfortunately, we don't have. I mean, we could, we the royal, we sign people in the scientific community, <clears throat> of which I'm more in the soft sciences, could just say, look, we know this is the case, but that would be dishonest, um, especially when we don't know. To the best of our knowledge. To the best of our knowledge, a mind is an emergent property of the brain, and consciousness is an emergent property of the mind. That's to the best of our knowledge. Now, to the person, and this is this is what doesn't happen. This is what does not happen from the presuppositional perspective. Is they they do not have they they have positively no capacity to back up their claim, and what they do is they say. How do you make sense of blank? How do you make sense of this? How do you make sense of that? Without this, you can't do that. They toss out a bunch of claims, thinking that they're standing on this tower of knowledge, but unfortunately, it's sand. And <clears throat> when 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 somebody well, like when somebody says they like they believe something, and Chris, you alluded to this before, um, talking about the belief in knowledge, right? Knowledge is a subset of belief. You can believe something without knowing it, but you cannot know something if you don't believe it. The reverse, like the the reverse, is not possible. Um, and so you, you can, you can, and Nate, you spoke to this, you can really, really, really believe, right? And, and you have to, and this is the other reason why the presuppositionalist perspective is so unbelievably dishonest, is you claim to have knowledge and want to close the book on something that is not, that is anti-biblical. Because Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. You must have faith. When you have knowledge, you no longer require faith. Pure, and, no, and, 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 and so the presupposition perspective, when you break it down to the lowest common denominator, you are being anti-biblical. That's, yeah. No, I don't think you understand, but I got to go. Uh, we can pick worries, this up man. at a different time, but uh, yeah, I mean, presuppositionalism is not, is not dishonest. Um, I've, again, I've been listening to more Bonson lectures. It's pretty good. I'm going to read Bonson's book um, on Van Til, and uh, we can circle back around to this because I think it's really good. And I think that there's a, just a lot of questions that the the unbeliever cannot answer. You know, again, we talked about the hard problem of consciousness, and it's just matter clanging off of other matter. That's just not an answer. And so, You're right, again, Chris. right, You're exactly. Right. There are, and there, there will questions. never be an answer. There, well, you, but you again, there will never. You, you can't know. Oh, that. I can. I can absolutely know stuff because I have the scripture to tell me that I am made in the image of God, Under, and that yeah, is outside. You interpret that through your senses, and so no, well, the, that's the, not the, true. the problem is. But anyway, the, the I do have to go. Is, no worries, man. The problem is, is that not knowing the answer to something is totally fine. There's lots of stuff we don't know. The most honest thing to say when you don't know something is, "I don't know." Anybody, and this is something that, uh, like. Uh, Nate, if you go back and find in uh, on Modern Day Debates, a YouTube channel, go back into the archive, you can find my first and what I hoped would have been my last interaction with our friend Ding Dong, um, where in my opening, like I wasted time doing an opening because all he said was the nonsense Chris just spewed. Um, what I said to him was, I said, it is, it is cripplingly easy to just make an assertion. It, it, is, it is more to be able to back up that assertion. And this is what you get from the presuppositional apologist. Claim, 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 claim. And then what they want to do is they want to switch it around. It's, it's, a, it's, a, very, it's a very interesting tactic because it, what they want to do is get you on the defensive. I'm going to make a bunch of claims and then you have to tell me why I'm wrong. And if you can't tell me why I'm wrong, see my model explains reality, yours doesn't, ha ha, God wins. It, life doesn't work that way. And unfortunately, I kind of have to go too. Um, but well, I kind of uh, have to go too. But if, <laughs> if yeah. you have a second, I would just say, and you know, I mean, we, we I kind of share your version of the precept because, um, you know, I, I've heard it explained really eloquently before. But 
it gives me no trouble because I already believe it. Like before I even knew what precept was uh, as a Christian, I, I already believed all the stuff that they eventually I would end up hearing them say. So for the mm -hmm. Christian, it's like, oh, well, yeah, I already believe that precept's great. But when you're trying to use that to convince people, I've never seen it go any way other than fighting because what, what, what you like, man, if there's something that gets you more like irate than uh, Romans one, um, Man, it is the precept thing, and I, I hear it, and I, I get it uh, to a point, too, because it, it, it does seem like a series of claims. Um, and it's like, well, if you believe, like, two big claims, like there's a God in the Bible's his word, well, then, you know, the precept wins and the atheist is converted. But that's of two really big asks. So of course. short of, like, divine intervention, why do you think that? And maybe, I mean, anyways, but I, I would say, like, you know, hearing you talk at the beginning, just food for thought, because, you know, you can do whatever you want with it. But generally speaking, um, you know, when you're saying, well, look, this reasoning is dishonest and, you know, this is dishonest. Um, if, though, God is like over here, which, you know, you can't prove. But if God's over here like, hey, I'm right. Here I am. Here I am. And it's like, you know, if people through reasoning because reasoning and, and their, their reasoning trail doesn't equal what the person needs to be like, you know, T's crossed and I's dotted. Um, mm -hmm. It's like sometimes people get in that trap of like they want to win that battle so much. And be like, see, I won the battle. Your logic didn't make sense. Therefore, I win at the expense of losing the war. So if, if someone – I'm not even talking about you at this point, but it's kind of no, – I agree with you 100 talking about When you're talking. So it's like if God's real and you know you shut you like shut down and claim victory because the guy's reasoning didn't add up to your level. And you're like, ah, see, I owned you. I won the battle. But God's like, yeah, I'm real. You're doomed. It's like, oh, crap. I lost the war. Um, so no, exactly, and and I, I agree, and I agree with you a thousand percent. But and we've we've said this a million times. I promise this is the last thing I say because I have to go. <laughs> is that is that the the strength the strength in in a claim is its ability to be falsified, right? So so when you make it so when you make a claim that's unfalsifiable, it's it's useless. Right. So, I mean, so when you say, you know, uh, you know, uh, like and, and this is something that our friend Ding Dong does all the time, like he, he, he'll go into rooms and he'll say God does not exist because and he switches it around. Um, and and this is what I fear, because, you know, like, you know, I've been I've been hanging out with you guys for a couple of years now. And, you know, I you know, I think, you know, you and yeah, I have a decent relationship for Chris. I do. I have a genuine concern for Chris, because like I've said before, and, and this is a hill that I'll, you know, quote unquote, die on. He's too smart to go down this rabbit hole. He really is too smart. Like, like all the history that he's read, all the work he's done with the church fathers, all this other stuff, to simply say, uh, I start with God. It's, it, it's, it, is a waste. it is a waste of someone who, in my opinion, could actually be – because there have been lots of conversations that Chris and I have had where they have been thought-provoking. Nothing Chris and I engaged about today is in any way thought provoking because it is a script, pure and simple. That's all it is, man. Yeah, and, and it's hard, right? Because then if you're a Christian who like fights against precepts, it's like, oh well, why? Blah 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 blah. It's like, but I'm like, well, as a Christian, I precepts great because I don't need anyone to convince me of anything. Like you know, I believe God's already convinced me of everything. Um, but as far as a, a tool to like get people closer to God. Um, I've only seen yelling and screaming. So anyway, it's good to talk yeah. to you. I'm glad you're back. Um, yeah, man. And, uh, yeah. And I, I, uh, this week, the rest of this week is a little shady for me, but I've got a really good amount of time next week because schools are, schools are out. It's March break up here next week. Um, so I do a fair bit of work in school. So I'll be doing mostly paperwork and not site things. So I'll be around more next week. <laughs> well, that's unfortunate because I have family coming into town next week um, for 10 days, and my kids are also on spring break. So uh, I may uh, – we'll see how it happens. I'll try to be here, but I may not be here as much. You're just going to have to pass me the torch and live with it. <laughs> All right, man. I'll catch you later. See you guys. All right. See ya. Okay, bye. Have an awesome day.